like that. Or 15, 15, 13, 13. Um, so um, we can count on about, you know, 20, 20 minutes from each of the panelists and, uh, and 10 or 15 minutes from the commentator and leave us room and time to, to chat and, and respond to questions and queries. Um, I, I, I guess I'll start with me. I'll make it really short. Uh, my name is Larry Clayton, and I'm retired from uh, uh, teaching history at the University of Alabama. Um, and um, I, I know Jorge from research I did in Peru many, many years ago on a Fulbright teaching down there just to say, say Sendero was at a, about its height, and it was an interesting, pleasant time to be in Lima. And anyhow, we've kept in touch, and uh, I, 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 I'm all over the map as far as interest and curiosities and writing. I'll just leave it off here, but it, it includes maritime and naval affairs in the colonial and part of the Spanish in, Empire in America. So our first um, speaker, uh, I think it's Alexandria, okay, uh, on, on the on the list here, and then and then it'll be Jorge, unless unless you guys want to reverse the uh, order, and then and then we have comments by uh, uh, Rodrigo Escribano Roca, um, and let me just read to you uh, just a short little paragraph on Alexandre. Um He's in the um, the, uh, the the historic service of defense in France. Uh, he's worked as a naval analyst at the French Defense Ministry back in the 80s and early and through the 90s. And in 1999, he joined the French Navy Historical Service. Uh, and uh, later on, it became the Defense Historical Service in Vincennes near Paris. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce the French the way it's supposed to be. I flunked one semester of French at, at my senior year at Duke on a, on a whim to take a take the class and the, the instructor was from Paris and he was very snobby about my Peruvian um, uh, pronunciation of his, his lovely French. So anyhow, I won't try that. He, uh, he uh, uh, Alexandre lectures on naval history at the French War College in Paris and at the French Naval Academy in Brest. He's a graduate of the Paris Institute of Political Studies and of the Sorbonne in history and political science. And he authored or co-authored um, a um, uh, histoire, histoire de sous marines. I'm going to pronounce it like the Peruvian sous marines with, uh, with a rear admiral. And that was translated into German. And, um, and he also published Hide and Seek, the untold, untold story of Cold War intelligence at sea. Well, that was the publisher, uh, the publisher idea to put that title, which I disagreed with because it's. Uh, <laughs> anyway. that, that's what historians do, Alexandra. <laughs> uh, and um, and he revised and translated into French and Russian uh, another history. Uh, I think it looks like like uh, aircraft history of of, uh, of carrier craft, and he's the coordinator of a French annual book. Um, the fleets in combat. I won't even try flotas de combate. And so I, I, I welcome him and uh, and turn the uh, turn the I don't know I guess the mic over to him to to uh, to read his paper or comment on it as a case he may like. Well, thank you very much, uh, Larry, and uh, I am thankful to Jorge uh, for initiating, of course, this panel and, and my research, because this is following some of his questions that I did prepare uh, and did research our archives uh, on the French Navy uh, in Latin American waters at the time of the uh, independences. And in this case, we, we will focus on the case of Peru. Uh, as you know, uh, Napoleon uh, opened the, the Pandora box uh, when he invaded uh, Spain uh, in 1807 because he gave a de facto independence to the four uh, vice uh, kingdoms of uh, New Spain, Granada, Rio de la Plata, and Peru. Uh, but in, in the very specific case of Peru, uh, this, this uh, kingdom 
remained loyal uh, to Spain uh, until nearly the end, or at least this was the last uh, stronghold of uh, the uh, loyalist or uh, royalist resistance uh, in the Americas. And uh, this uh, vice kingdom uh, had been uh, fighting uh, the uh, juntas, which were uh, seeking independence. And so at this time, uh, France uh, had lost uh, part of its naval power with the defeat of Trafalgar, and uh, Britain had become an ally of Spain, uh, while at the same time, uh, Britain had been trying to uh, support uh, the independence movement just for, uh, well, for, for trade uh, interests. So uh, Britain was in uh, as a uh, contradictory uh, situation. Uh, trade was a priority uh, for the French government uh, after the demise of Napoleon. As you know, Napoleon was defeated twice in uh, 1814, 1815, and he, uh, in 1815, the restoration, the kings returned to power in France with King Louis XVIII. And at the same time, in Spain, you had his cousin, King Ferdinand uh, VII, and uh, obviously, uh, in the new order, the new European order of the Holy uh, Alliance, it seemed that France could support uh, Spain in the Americas. Uh, but actually, uh, France decided to go its own way for its own interest, and France had uh, made the judgment that the uh, independence would prevail, and therefore that it was in the interest of France not to let Britain, not to let the United States capture the whole market, the whole South American market. And it is, of, of course, after Nap the Napoleonic Wars, the French economy was uh, in a dear state so in order to restore the state's finances. And this uh, consideration uh, was, had already existed at the beginning of the 18th century, at the time of the War of Spanish Succession, when for the very first time, uh, France, and Spain had been allies in America. As you know, they were enemies under the Habsburg, but with the uh, grandson of Louis XIV becoming the, the, the Spanish king, France had uh, uh, protected, started to protect the Spanish uh, convoys and this uh, French naval protection had uh, permitted uh, Spain to go on fighting in this war until 1713. But the French finances at the time were also in a very bad condition. And at that time, this trade, the South Sea trade, had been extremely profitable. And This uh, sea trade had been dominated mainly by Salo, by actually uh, private entrepreneurs, uh, corsairs, uh, privateers, uh, and this uh, trade was beneficial for the French state because obviously the French state was collecting taxes on this trade. And this trade was mainly actually uh, to uh, Concepcion, but also to Arica, Ilo, Pisco. Uh, and this trade ended with the end of this war of Spanish succession. So it was a very unique moment, but very profitable uh, for France because actually this trade was going on from the Peruvian coast to, um, uh, to China. And uh, 
the profits which were made uh, were absolutely con considerable. So France, after the defeat of Napoleon, had an interest again for trade, uh, taking advantage, obviously, as you all know, of the fact that uh, Spain was not in the position to enforce its uh, monopoly uh, because of the independence. And as I said, the British were playing uh, a double game uh, because on the one hand, they had been the ones who had given some advice for the military expedition which had been sent to Gran Colombia uh, under Pablo Morillo, but on the other hand, they were also sending some French veterans uh, to fight on the other side, you see. So the British were really playing a double role. Uh, and uh, uh, established a naval presence, and this naval presence had an overwhelming influence on the British commerce. And I'm quoting a French naval officer, uh, Captain Drouot, who was sent uh, to the South Atlantic uh, in 1819 and who reported in the situation in the South Sea. Uh, and he uh, observed that the, the Englishmen with their insinuations and maritime forces uh, would be the new masters. And he noted that the British Navy, the Royal Navy was acting as commercial agent was securing access uh, to the Peruvian ports and also safeguarding the wealth of the uh, royalist, the, the loyalist uh, families who were uh, very upset uh, about their uh, financial interest because of the of the situation. And uh, at the time, uh, the famous uh, disgrace. Navy Captain uh, Lord uh, Cochrane uh, was, as we know, uh, in charge of the Chilean Navy, but he had also uh, attacked a French uh, merchant ship, and uh, uh, the French Navy was very worried by its, uh, uh, because of its absence. France could not protect its trade in the area. So as a consequence, of uh, this report, which was read by King Louis the 18th, the report by this Captain Drouot, uh, France sent a first expedition to the South Sea in uh, January, February, 1821, uh, under Admiral Julien Lagravière, who visited uh, both uh, Chile and also uh, the this uh, kingdom and the Viceroy in Peru, uh, securing some guarantees uh, uh, from the local authorities who were very impressed by the presence of three French warships, including a ship of the line. And in 1822, France uh, decided to establish a permanent naval station in the South Sea, uh, which was uh, under the, the command first of Captain Macro then of the Baron Roussin in 1823, and then of Admiral uh, Rosamel in 1824. But at that time uh, occurred uh, another circumstance which created much um, confusion. Uh, much confusion because um, France uh, invaded Spain. France invaded Spain to re-establish King Ferdinand, uh, uh, Fernando VII, uh, who had been deposed by the Spanish Cortes. And it's interesting because uh, the royalist, the, the Spanish party in, in Peru was actually very close, very supportive of the Cortes. So it was actually uh, against their own king. Uh, in a way, so they didn't they didn't like uh, what France had done in Spain to reestablish the king, and on the other hand, for the patriots, the patriotas, uh, the fact that France had invaded Spain and reestablished the king 
was clear evidence that France was certainly going to support and perhaps to direct the Spanish effort in Latin America to uh, retain its land. Uh, of course, this was absolutely not uh, the French uh, political objective uh, at the time. And uh, the French uh, South Sea Station in 1823 had to withdraw for three months because actually the admiral in charge didn't know what to do. He didn't know if he had to fight against uh, the, uh, the Viceroy, the, the Viceroy, the, the Viceroy. Uh, of Peru, because of course it, it was France was actually not officially at war with Spain, only at war with the Cortes, but de facto at war with Spain. And um, so it, it withdrew in a, uh, the, the French squadron withdrew in 1823 and then returned in, in 1824. Um, this uh, French naval presence uh, was also uh, accompanied by some political ideas in France. Political ideas, perhaps, to establish um, uh, some independent uh, Bourbon monar monarchies in uh, Latin America, in Spanish America. Uh, it would be a kind of a compromise. Those would be uh, independent states from Spain, but with princes from the Bourmo family, so that would be acceptable to Spain and to France. And this would block or uh, reduce the British and the American uh, influence uh, in Latin America. But this plan was opposed uh, by the United States uh, on the one hand, and also uh, by uh, Britain. And there was a Congress actually in 1822 in Verona, uh, where the French, uh, the loose French plans, ideas uh, were uh, opposed by the British, uh, by uh, the Americans. But it's interesting also to see that the famous a Monroe Doctrine of uh, 1823, which often is being presented as uh, having been uh, initiated against French plans in Latin America, was probably uh, directed to other, um, I mean, maybe directed against the Russians who were moving south on the uh, Pacific coast uh, and already established in California, and actually that it had absolutely no impact on France. France was not uh, impressed with the Monroe Doctrine. France was more concerned by the British opposition to its plans, and actually this is the reason why France uh, decided to backtrack. Um, so, as I said, the French intervention in Spain had created a confusion among both the royalists and both the patriots, and uh, they were both suspicious of French uh, intentions. And France, of, you, of course, had no diplomatic representation. Uh, uh, France had tried to send in Peru uh, a secret agent uh, from, uh, Havana, uh, from the, the Havana in Cuba, but the secret agent had been arrested by the, the vice king and put it into jail. So France had decided to send some naval officers who would be posted ashore to take care of France's maritime interests. They would play the role of consul. So uh, an officer was designated for Peru. His name was Demarge, but uh, the news that France would send some naval officers to Latin America had been reported in the press, and the press was convinced that those naval officers would have a political role. They would not just be commerce agents. And for this reason, their presence uh, was already denounced uh, in the local media. Um, 
in January of 1824, uh, an interesting circum circumstance occurred, the capture of a French merchant ship, uh, La Vigie, uh, by a Spanish flagged uh, ship of uh, an ambiguous status, uh, the General uh, Quintanilla, uh, Quintanilla, General Quintanilla. And uh, this ship was actually a former Colombian uh, ship which had been uh, captured by mutineers and uh, the leader of the mutineers had decided to side uh, with the this uh, kingdom of Peru with Spain. Uh, but actually, very obviously, uh, this uh, ship was pursuing its own goals of, uh, I would say, committing piratical acts. And uh, the, that, so that ship captured that French uh, merchant ship in January. And in May, a French uh, corvette arrived uh, trying to investigate what had happened and was determined to capture uh, this ship because actually the justification which had been given by that Spanish flag ship uh, that there was a state of war between France and Spain uh, was no longer valid in January of 1824. But the local authorities assured the French captain of the corvette um, uh, that La Diligente, uh, that this ship belonged to the Spanish uh, kingdom, that this ship was actually uh, a man of war, a warship, a regular warship. Uh, and at first, the French uh, captain believed that statement. But when he was in port, uh, in the presence of the General Quintanilla, uh, Quintanilla the General Quintanilla opened fire on the French warship. So the French warship chased the General Quintanilla for a whole night and captured the, that ship the following day and uh, uh, generating protests uh, from the vice, the vice King of Peru. Um, the Vice King of Peru demanded the release of that ship and uh, the French captain refused. And so the Vice King of Peru decided or I would say pretended that he would seize all French properties and detain uh, the French citizens, the French subjects uh, on Peruvian soil. Uh, actually, uh, this was just a declaration because the French traders were Although they protested to that French captain, demanding that he should release the General Quintanilla, uh, were able to continue the trade. The captured General Quintanilla was taken to Chile uh, by the French captain, uh, and uh, he received the French captain and absolutely uh, enthusiastic welcome in Chile uh, by General Frere uh, for the fact that he had captured General Kitani. Um, actually, France was really trying to stick to neutrality, and France was eager to obtain compensation for the uh, unfortunate owner of that ship, La Vigie, because the ship La Vigie had been taken into first Spanish service as uh, a privateer under the Spanish flag, but then captured by the Patriotas and was now uh, under the Peruvian flag. Uh, so uh, for the French uh, Admiral Rosamel, who uh, arrived uh, just at that moment, this was a problem because uh, if he were to hand over the General Quintanilla uh, to the Spanish authorities, uh, he needed immediate, immediate uh, compensation because he could not r reclaim uh, the the ship La Vigie, which was now who was now uh, under Peruvian 
uh, serve in the Peruvian service. So uh, there was a, a very uh, ambiguous uh, relation between the naval agent who had been sent to Peru who was chasing the Viceroy, but the Viceroy was very busy uh, commandeering uh, the uh, Spanish troops uh, against uh, the Patriotas and uh, at the same time uh, had decided to uh, um, uh, name uh, a, a brigadier who was on board the ship of the line Asia as the one who would decide the case uh, of the uh, General Quintanilla. And the French Admiral uh, Rosamel uh, arrived himself in person in Peru uh, because his naval agent uh, who had been sent earlier had been obliged to flee uh, uh, because of the um, uh, suspicion that he was uh, plotting uh, against uh, the either the, the Spanish authorities or the Patriotas. And when Admiral de Rosamel arrived in Peru, he, he had an interview uh, with Bolivar where he was able to dispel the Patriotas' fears uh, about uh, French intentions. And in the end, uh, the case of the General Quintanilla was resolved by selling that ship uh, so that the, the money uh, generated by the sale would be given to the merchant. And at the same time, by sending a warship to Chiloe, uh, as you know, the last uh, uh, place uh, of resistance in the Americas uh, by uh, the Spaniards after uh, the surrender of the fortress uh, in Cajao and obviously after the defeat. Uh, of Ayacucho, uh, and, but there, the real General Quintanilla, who, who was the one who received uh, the French delegation, uh, had no money to give and just signed papers recognizing the Spanish responsibility uh, in the case of the Quintanilla. And following this uh, incident of the Quintanilla, France was still eager to establish commercial regular relations with the new authorities of Peru, but was unwilling to commit itself to send uh, an official uh, diplomat uh, because uh, it didn't want to antagonize Spain. But in, in 1827, France did send uh, a commercial agent to be named Consul General of France in Peru. At first, he was rejected by the, the Peruvian government, but when Bolivar uh, left uh, Peru, the new um, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, agreed to receive this man, uh, Jean-Baptiste Chomet de Fossé, and this was when uh, we, we can say that formal relations were established uh, between France and Peru, although uh, uh, Peru had to wait for 1852 for France to extend a full uh, recognition with uh, the sending to Peru of a, a regular uh, ambassador. But we can say that uh, during the process of the Peruvian independence, the French Navy uh, was present to support the trade, uh, although that trade was not as beneficial as it was during the war of uh, Spanish succession. It laid the, the basis for uh, further uh, contacts uh, between France and Peru in the later years. But the, but the French Navy uh, had the a key role, uh, at least to protect the French merchants, also their, uh, their trade was not extremely profitable, unlike during the War of Spanish Succession. So I thank you for your attention.
Sorry, I'm extremely sorry because I can't hear you. For some reason, we cannot hear you, Lawrence. I think you, you are in, in mute state. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 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 I'm sorry. Uh, I was muted. And uh, I think our wives would like to have that same button sometimes with us. Um, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> uh, it's amazing to me how, how slow communications were and how much authority. Uh, a, a naval squadron or or just a commanding officer had on the making of relations between countries when it was months and months that he was separated. This was the old Navy, right? There weren't any girls on my ship either. Uh, uh, they uh, separated from from headquarters, maybe Madrid or Paris or, or London. And uh, I, I've read up some studies along those lines. And now the communications are instant. And the decisions, I don't think, are very solid or, or are very well informed by the people who have to make instant decisions. Okay, I'll leave that aside. Uh, let me turn to uh, Jorge. Jorge, where are you? ¿Dónde estás, Jorge? He's, he's supposed to be next up here. He has disappeared for the moment. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'd like us to have him. There he is. I think I see him coming back. Uh, Kevin, do you know where Jorge, Dr. Ortiz is? Uh, Hello. He, he's disappeared to another panel, but uh, I, 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 don't, I would introduce our, our commentator, but I want you to hear Jorge's paper before he comments on it. Estás ahí, Jorge? Yeah. Ah, okay. He's there. Okay. Uh, let me, uh, there he is. There he is. I see him now waving his hands. Let me introduce the, the second speaker and, and the, the final speaker before we get to the comments. Um, and 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 what his what his paper and I I forgot to mention that the the, the paper that uh, that uh, Alexander read was the French Navy and the Independence of Peru, which is kind of obvious. But and this is what his paper he and he's got he's on he's the only one there, so he's got he's got the advantage of presenting his visuals. This last the Spanish last naval efforts to defend the Viceroyalty of Peru, and uh, his present. Uh, Post is uh, is the uh, director of the Archivo General de la Nación, uh, which puts him right in the middle of a of a lot of not only history but Peruvian politics. Um, okay, he's a retired commander in the Peruvian Navy. Uh, he got his bachelor of science from the Peruvian Naval Academy, his master's in maritime strategy, and the, and he attended the Peruvian. He's actually a Marine. Okay, who who. Who was uh, became you know all we, we we in the navy always say you know the marines are just a branch of the navy which always irritates marines but that's okay and he he was a marine and and, and but also a naval officer and uh, and he got a phd from uh, saint andrews university in scotland and uh, he became a professor at the peruvian naval college in the universidad nacional mayor de, de san marcos the the principal public university in peru and then uh, uh, back in 2008 and 2009, he taught at the Naval Academy, right? Well, I was going to say right here, not here in Tuscaloosa, but right there in Annapolis. He was uh, the distinguished chair uh, 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 named after Dr. Leo Schiffer in, in Naval and Military History at the Naval Academy. So he spent two years there. Uh, he's written several books and articles on politics and maritime and naval history. He's the general secretary of Thalassa. An Association of Maritime History and Maritime and Naval History. Uh, he's also a member of the Academia Chilena de la Historia and the Academia Nacional de Historia of Ecuador. Uh, and uh, he's an old friend. We, we met, I, I shouldn't say how many years ago, but I think it was 1988. And, uh, and we've been in touch ever since. And he's, 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 he's been one of the great promoters of, of not only Peruvian naval history, but the, the naval history of not only the vice royalty of Peru, but naval history across all of the American nations and uh, into the Pacific. And uh, so uh, from my perspective, uh, he's a great scholar, a good friend, and I present him to you for his paper. Peru, uh, Peru. <laughs> Jorge, uh, you got it. Okay, thanks, Larry. Uh, thanks all. 
Thank you for attending this session. Uh, we are in Peru, we are celebrating the 200th anniversary of our independence, which is tricky because on July 28, 2021, it was proclaimed at Lima. But independence is a long process. Here, happy sentence. That was longer. Uh, maybe the next one. So, uh, I, I'm trying to say that we should have an idea of what, what's going on. Uh, Alexander has already mentioned what uh, was happening in Spain. In Spain was invaded by the French, well, uh, in 1808. Um, uh, a war, a rebellion all around Spain erupted against the, the French. Uh, it, the, the Spaniards called that the independence war. It took six years to expel the French, finally. And of course, uh, before that, Spain was already in, in trouble, political trouble. But the independence, uh, this independence war uh, enriched the country, all what they got, all a lot of money, a lot of manpower, uh, a lot of things were committed to that. And of course, uh, the Navy, the Spanish Navy, was already weakened after Trafalgar was uh, very much uh, abandoned to focus on the main effort we were to fight out the French. So, the, in that period, also in, in several parts of Spain and, and the Spanish uh, Empire, uh, what they call uh, audiencias or cabildos or the main cities organize themselves in councils or juntas, as the Spanish was called, which is okay. The main cities, the main citizens decided how they will protect this area in the name of the legal king, which is uh, Ferdinand VII, who had been captured by the bloody French. And we will keep this area in behalf of our real king. But the problem is, uh, that's right for the speech, that most of these juntas were actually formed by Creoles, what we know, Spanish descendants born locally. Uh, so this idea of, of keeping loyal to the crown began to shift very quickly in some cases. You say, well, why do we want to protect this for the king? We better protect this for us. Well, that process began and independence began to erupt almost everywhere. Back in Spain, the, the war with the French ended in 1814, so the king returned. And uh, during this time, the, the, one of these juntas was uh, proclaimed itself, we replace the king, and all the other juntas are under us. Uh, okay, well, not everybody was happy with that. Some of juntas in, in several parts of America say, no, we don't have to depend on this guy. They have the same position as we have. But the junta decided to call a Congress. And that Congress to build a uh, call people for everywhere of the Spanish Dominion and work out a constitution. We must say a liberal constitution. So, okay, we, we are going to have a king, yes, but this king is going to rule under the constitution. It was in 1812. Okay, everybody happy, as Alexander mentioned, most of the military, the Spanish military and Navy were supporting the idea of the constitution. They were liberal. That when in 1814 the king returned, he, one of the first things he did is to abolish the constitution. He said, oh, no, I, I, I'm here now, no constitution for me. So that creates certain problems. Um, and of course, during that time, until 1814, Spain was unable to send almost a single soldier to America. 
Okay, 1497, king, actual the king once again, but there was turmoil in Spain. Um, between 1814 and 1820, the Spanish was able to send some expeditions to try to recover America. Uh, but one of those who was supposed to sail early in 1820, things erupted. So they proclaimed and they said, no, we won't get back the Kirsty Peak. And a uh, small civil war for that, and the king was obligated to restore the constitution. And that remained for three years until he managed to get the French support. And the French invade uh, Spain once again in 1823 with basically the idea to give Ferdinand VII once again full power. So you should understand that this big picture created a lot of unrest. Um, Alexander had mentioned most, most of the uh, military leaders in Spain sent to America were liberals. Were, were, if we are going to say, were more uh, keen to the constitution than to the king itself. But they had to fight in behalf of the idea of the Spanish possession. Okay, now what happened in America? In America, we have uh, loyalist forces, of course, but most of them were local. Very few of them actually were from Spain. Uh, just to give you an idea, I'm not going to enter in detail, but just to give you an idea, the last and most decisive battle of the, of the independence of America was in, in Peru in 1824. Peru was the, the Loyalist stronghold in South America. Uh, since 1808 until 1816, uh, Peruvian troops, royal uh, royalty troops, were reconquered Chile, uh, restore the Loyalist government in present day Bolivia, fight in North Argentina, restore twice the government in, in Ecuador. So, uh, most of those troops were local. Right? So um, the final effort of independence uh, came over in 1824 with the battle of, uh, of Ayacucho. To European standards or to US standards, it's a small battle. All, all, all together, there were roughly 15,000 fighting. Uh, perhaps, only perhaps, 1,000 were Spanish. All the other were local. Fighting in two sides. It was, a, in fact, it was a huge civil war. And, and among those southern Spaniards, they were fighting in both sides. So I, I found out at least three couple of brothers fighting both sides. Right? So that's what the general thing. So that the, the, the war in Chile continued when the this gentleman, Viceroy Pesuela, was to rule from 1816 to 1820. Uh, and before that, uh, and until 1818, the situation was that the, the Viceroyalty had control of the city. Uh, it has a small squadron. Uh, the Spanish America has divided in four maritime department or naval department. One is basically La Habana, they have responsibility for the Caribbean. The other one was basically in Montevideo, has responsibility for South Atlantic. The Uruguayans say that they discovered Malvina, or Falkland, so the Argentinians. Yeah. Uh, Callao, they have responsibility from Panama all the way south. And San Blas de Nayarit, who have responsibility for not all that. So, at Callao, there was a small force, uh, very few in fact, that uh, they have no opposition at it. And that is going to change in 1819. Callao uh, has 
All right, let's do a strong defense. Um, this is a, a drawing of a Callao board. It's a that uh, fortress is still there. Uh, and here uh, have a, a number for the, the fort defense itself of a number of gambles. Uh, during the Callao was suffering blockade for a long time. They have chain defenses and a lot of things that was usually for this kind of effort. But in 1819, things changed. What happened? Um, Chile was reconquered by the Peruvian Royalty in 1814. And uh, then in 1817, uh, a new campaign came over to get uh, independence of Chile, the definitive independence of Chile. Through uh, those who have been uh, not lost in 1840, we drove across the Cordillera uh, with the help of our Argentinian General San Martin, created a new army, and in 1817 began a new campaign. And from 1817 until 1818, they managed to establish what they call the new. Uh, patria, which is uh, instead of the old patria, we was just so living in the south of the forest. And what the leaders of this uh, effort, but mainly uh, Bernardo Higgins, who was uh, proclaimed the head of the new Indian government, and also San Martin, who was helping him, uh, they uh, had learned the lesson of the first. Uh, uh, the ending of the first war. So, so long the loyalists controlled the sea, they could send troops. And if they manage to get enough troops, uh, we are probably get involved in a long war. So what we have to do is first of all to challenge that control of the sea. Um, <coughs> And for that point, the Chilean government made a significant investment. So, of course, if we are comparing this with uh, European naval history, it will be very small. Then, for that purpose, what's enough? The, uh, the country uh, owns money to buy. Uh, a, a number of uh, vessels. Among the, 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 the largest one was those frigates, uh, San Martin, uh, uh, Lautaro. The second one was, in fact, a uh, Spanish frigate, Catrus. The, the San Martin and Lautaro were former uh, East Indiamen, who actually could be rated as ship of the line. Um, and the Spaniards, uh, and they have small vessels, of course. And the Spaniards have uh, the main force was three frigates, uh, which are pretty small compared to this to their force. So basically, in, uh, since 1819, both the viceroy in Peru and the commander of the navy in Peru realized that they could not match. Them. So they adopt this idea of fleeting beam. So we will we, we'll save the fleet until reinforcements came from Spain. But reinforcements never came. Uh, that, that, uh, they tried to send, but eventually it came. Uh, so it went well. The Chilean squadron was able to capture a Spanish. That, there was a first expedition, the first attempt the Spanish to send reinforcements to Peru. So they had to go around the Cape. Going around the Cape is a heavy, heavy thing, not only for nautical purposes, but for health. Usually, one third of the crew get sick or die in that time. Um, this was the first reinforcement sent around the Cape. Um, the frigate, uh, I know was Maritabel was captured, there was a convoy of 10 ships, one of them deserted in, in the Atlantic and entered Buenos Aires and, and they got the, the orders. There. So 
for middle side is a lot of children government, the children government set up uh, and kept to the, the Manizares. Um, was uh, incorporated to the Chilean Navy at uh, O'Higgins. Next one. And the same year, uh, actually was the commander of the Royal Navy, uh, Lord Cochran, was uh, hired by the Chilean government, uh, ranked as vice admiral and assumed good command of this, uh, this squad. Um, he realized uh, Cochran was a very Direct uh, naval officer, he had distinguished himself in the French, uh, in the French Revolutionary War, and he made two expeditions uh, over the Peruvian coast. Uh, Attack Callao twice. Callao was well attacked. Callao did be surrendered by the sea. Uh, there, uh, eventually, during the second expedition, he was locating Callao when a uh, Spanish frigate arrived. Um, that Spanish frigate was the Prema. And the Prema was part, yes, the Prema was part of the second expedition sent by the Spaniards, trying to change this balance of the form. And this, uh, but this was a uh, very sad experience. They, were, they sent two ships of the line. Uh, the Spanish Navy was in terrible conditions, they bought uh, seven ships from Russia, were very rotten condition. One of them was uh, Alexander, Alejandro, Alexander the first. Uh, she had to turn back to the middle of the Atlantic, it was taking too much water. The other one was uh, the San Telmo, the ship line, who was uh, seen the last time south of Cape Horn, having a loose part of his mass, and eventually uh, grounded on the Antarctic. So they were the first to reach Antarctic. Uh, and the other one was the prayer. This, this frigate for Rich Kayao when Kayao was on the bouquet. So they realized on that and eventually ended up at Guayaquil, north of the present day of Antarctic. Uh, and this is, okay, the next one. Now, let's go on. after that is the Spanish have this main force, three frigates, and the Chileans have a stronger force. But the Spaniards keep going, trying to ask in Spain for reinforcements. Spain was made very important because they had nothing over to them. Then. So what, uh, there was a lot of uh, small movement. The Spaniards keep their fleet in, in the proper sense of what they being, trying to use the fleet to move forces from one place to another. Then by 1820, they realized that, okay, we don't have control of the sea. What the Chileans are going to do is to project their force in life, bring the war through. And for that purpose, the basic idea is, okay, well, what's the main uh, objective in Peru? Lima. So we should bring forces who are being Still fighting in, in present day Bolivia, we part of those forces to reinforce Lima, and the ships were moving out from Callao to several places along the coast, trying to avoid engagement with the Chilean fleet and moving the forces from one place to another. In, in that effort, uh, in September 1820, the invasion came over. Uh, Chilean squadron. Uh, the number of transport landed south of uh, Callao, south of Lima. Uh, uh, in a moment, it was two frigates, the Prima, uh, oh, next one. Yeah, Venganza, Prima uh, Venganza, were doing one of these movies. We're outside Callao. And when they returned to Callao, okay, Callao was a little under the volcano. So these two frigates, finally ended up in Acapulco because, okay, we, we cannot go there. Guayaquil have already changed the plan. Okay? We cannot go Guayaquil. Okay, let's go uh, Panama. Okay, they stay in Panama to get some food and ended up in Guayaquil, ended up in Guayaquil when Guayaquil was changed hands uh, to the loyalists, to the independence. Uh, they 
help to restore the law in the government, then there was a long struggle. And so those three gates ended up in Bali. Meanwhile, Callao was under blockade, and during this blockade, uh, in the night of uh, this one, please. Yeah, that, that overall picture of Callao, this one. And in the night of uh, November the 5th, the district, the last thing the gate, the Spanish brigade of Brava was captured in a real intrepid uh, assault by Cochrane and his men. Uh, after that, Callao uh, remained in loyal, in loyal hands until September. The September uh, surrendered Callao. Uh, that creates a new, uh, another actor in, in the area, which is the old Peruvian Navy. And the Peruvian Navy, well, was four ones, began in September. Um, its main duty was to help the operations in, in South Peru because the Viceroy uh, and Royalist forces had withdrawn Lima and moved South Peru. And they will remain there from 1821 to 1824. So the effort now, there was no Spanish naval presence in, in Peru, but uh, the effort now was to uh, keep the war going on inland. The only presence the Spanish had in the Pacific at that time was in Chiloé, which is south of Chile. Uh, okay. Uh, in 1824, uh, there was a revolt at Callao, and Callao once again came in hands of the loyalists. And it will remain in hands of the loyalists until January 1826. Uh, Chiloé will remain in hands of the loyalists until January 1826. Uh, in 1824, the the Spaniards made the last effort to try to reverse the situation. A small one and too late. It's a ship of line, the uh, Asia, that's a painting of the Asia around the table, uh, and a, a brick, the king. But as I mentioned, it was too small and too late to change things. Uh, eventually, with this. Uh, that was rich Callao was in September 1824. Three months later, two, almost three months later, was the final battle of Ayacucho. And the Viceroy to surrender all his troops. And the ships were ordered to leave. The, the story of the ship was sad because the, most of them using it uh, on his way to the Philippines. One of them ended up in Mexico, the other one ended up in Chile. But uh, there was two places in which this surrender of the Spaniards didn't took effect, at Callao and Chile. Uh, General Rodil, at Callao, said he don't acknowledge that surrender, as well as General Quintanilla at Chile saying, well, we are not ready. And there was some other truth in present-day Bolivia. The war in Bolivia lasted for almost one more year, and at Chiloé and Callao until January 1826. In both places, there are met some cities, but that was a minor effort. <coughs> well, in a general sense, Spain, Spain was exhausted. It was too much with very little force to try to keep it together to protect. And that's uh that's the story. Okay. Larry. Yeah, I was waiting for another slide, yeah. No, 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 no. You can you you, you can still wait. <laughs> <laughs> I uh before I turned it over to Rodrigo, uh, just my little comment on how long these guys stayed out at sea. Uh, you know, a ship, a, a voyage from England or France or Spain to Peru uh, was not like getting on a, an old 
I'll, I'll date myself, an old Pan Am jet and, and, or a Pan American and Grace Airways jet, Pan American, flying from Miami to Panama and Lima, you know, in the space of a few hours. It was years. I remember reading about whalers coming out of New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts and New England that would sail into the Pacific to go whaling and they would be out there four or five years. Um, yeah. and, and, and we're just so used to instant communications, it's hard for us to understand how, how long these voyages were. And, and again, how influential a few ships and a few men could have on national affairs because they, you know, they didn't have uh, Instagram and they didn't have instant uh, 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 communications through satellites to find out what is it you want me to do? And of course, the people back in the people back in Paris and London and Washington would go, uh, duh, I don't know, you know. Okay, I'm not going to comment on contemporary politics. I could I could probably offend most people, but I bet with this group here, we'd all be on the same ship. Okay, the the, the speaker who is going to make comments is um, appropriately enough. After the Spanish have been beat up by the French and the Peruvians, he's a native-born Spaniard who lives in, in, in Chile. And, and let me just introduce him to you uh, a little more formally than that. His, uh, his name is Rodrigo Esquirano Roca, and he teaches at the, uh, at the Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez in, uh, in, uh, in Valparaíso, uh, Viña del Mar, some of the most beautiful parts of Chile, you know, that, that, uh, unless you like the mountains, you know, and going down to the sea and all that in the southern part of Chile. He got a PhD from the School of Humanities and Communications Arts at Western Sydney University. Uh, you know, kind of emphasizing the ties between the West Coast of South America and, uh, and Australia and that part of the world. Um, and then he also, uh, I think, wrote a dissertation on Latin America and the European Union in the international context for the uh, Latin American Studies program at the University of Alcalá in Spain in 2019. His research areas are really across a, a broad stream of areas, include Atlantic history, the history of ideas, intellectual history, imperial history, the history of political cultures, and the history and the theory of history, whatever that is. Um, historians are, you know, all over the whole schmeal. Uh, his doctoral thesis was, is soon to be published, uh, and it addressed the transatlantic imageries of European historicism, focusing, I like this one, on the impact of Spanish American independence on the political cultures of Spain and the United Kingdom. Usually it's the other way around, you know. How did the Brits and how did the Spanish and how, how did the French affect Argentina and Brazil? I would throw the Portuguese in there as well, you know. Let's be kind of universal here. But this looks at it the other way. And, and I think that, that that kind of disproportionate effect it's probably grown in the twenty in the twenty first century, um, and uh, his interests extend to cultural history, the cultural history of, uh, I just of the European imperial monarchies and the American republics that split from them, and uh, mm -hmm. he's got several articles on the way, and uh, and he's a delight, delightful person to chat with, even though he's a Spaniard. That's okay, <laughs> and he's he's got a good enough sense of humor to appreciate that. And I'll turn it over to uh, Rodrigo for his comments, and then we'll open it up to uh, to to the group here um, for for your own comments and questions and and whatever else you would like to add. Rodrigo, it's to you. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, well, hello everyone. Also, I am a Spaniard, and, and I'm a part of the losing side of of these stories uh, that Alexandre and and Jorge has. Uh, shared with us um, it is it goes without saying that it is an uh, honor uh, for me to comment on Alexander's papers uh, as a commentator of this panel the duty entrusted uh, to me has been undistinguishable from the pleasure i have uh, derived from reading uh, and I do not say this on a whim i have had fun and i have learned both papers uh, have the virtue uh, of seeding a look at Latin American emancipation that is very unusual in the historiography of the last 30 years. In this field, we are used to terrestrial perspectives, uh, which focus on the world of ideas, constitutional processes, and more timidly, military confrontations on the ground. Uh, undoubtedly, the works of Eduardo Cavieres, Jaime Mundo Rodríguez, Pedro Pérez, Michael Costello, or Jeremy Adelman 
have given us valuable discoveries regarding the political dynamics in which the independence took place. Okay. However, it seems, as an England has suggested, that we are losing sight of the fact that the Spanish-American revolutions were, in addition to a process of endogenous mutation, a warlike confrontation of global dimensions with enormous geostrategic implications in all the world, uh, in all the Atlantic world uh, specifically. Moreover, we sometimes forget that the independence, particularly that of Peru, took place in a context of inter-imperial disputes. Uh, the Spanish monarchy lost the logistical basis of its transatlantic power. At the same time, the United Kingdom and France tried to expand their influence over a suddenly fragmented Hispanic world. Uh, uh, authors such as Hilda Sabato, Flavia Macias, or Graciela Iglesias Rogers are contributing to renew the military history of the processes of Republican construction. The problem is that their contributions turn their backs on the ocean. It is usual that in the stories about the military and diplomatic vicissitudes that brought to an end the Spanish domination in South America, the sea appears as a mere parenthesis, as a transit space, uh, space that acts as an interlude or pause uh, to make way for the continental events. events sorry. To many readers, the fleets appear simply as transporters of troops, merchants, uh, and secret agents. Uh, both Jorge and Alexandre contribute to demonstrate that, on the contrary, the ocean was one of the epicenters where the breakup of the Spanish Empire occurred. Mm -hmm. The organization and deployment of the navies of the contenders played a leading role in determining the triumph of the emancip emancipatory processes and in the organization of the economic and diplomatic fabric that defined posterior uh, Republican constructions. As I say, both writings contribute to compose a panoramic vision of how naval power was decisive in the decline of Viceregal Peru. I am not going to spend any time summarizing what Jorge and Alexander have already told us. I prefer to use my time to ask, some, to ask them some questions that perhaps they can answer after my intervention, okay? So, so that all of us can steal a little bit more of their knowledge. Jorge has given a very detailed explanation of how the administration of these Royce, Petuela, and La Serna managed, uh, managed to sustain a fleet capable of standing up to the Chilean Navy, despite the frantic and erratic attempts of re reinforcement from Madrid. I was shocked uh, to learn from your text, Jorge, how the Bisruas mobilized local resources to make up for the shortcomings of the Navy. In this regard, uh, the reading has raised a couple of questions for me. Uh, first of all, do we know who the recruits were who joined the Real Armada in Peru and the private companies in the context of the war? Were they, in, were they in the inhabitants of Peru's coastal cities or peninsular subjects? Uh, who were those sailors that uh, engrossed uh, the, uh, the last attempt of uh, maintaining Spanish naval power? I also wondered that what was the process I also wonder what was the process by which merchant ships were used as warships? Did the loyalist merchants participate voluntarily or did it work by requisitioning? Uh, finally, I have a more complex question, uh, typical of a melancholic Spaniard, I think. You assert that Pezuela or many, on many occasions made wise decisions regarding the, the direction of the Navy. But at the same time, you reflect how the governments of Madrid failed to give him adequate support. Do you think that the monarchy could have made better use of its naval resources? Uh, to what extent do you believe that the collapse of the Real Armada impacted the loss of Peru? Well, Alexandre, your paper was also very revealing for me. There are many elements to highlight. I was particularly struck by the systematicity with which the restoration governments associated the presence of their navy with the defense of French commercial interests beyond any ideological consideration. That is, that is very, very interesting, isn't it? I have fewer questions than for Jorge, but I think they are somewhat more complicated. Uh, 
I would like you uh, to clarify why Luis uh, 18's ministers uh, made such a significant effort to deploy the Navy in the French, uh, if the French trade in Peru was not so important. Why, why did they make this effort? Uh, uh, to what extent, this is our question, to what extent was the Navy seen as an instrument that would consolidate French influence in the region in the decades to come? Did restoration governments foreshadow the naval policy of gumbo diplomacy that France would carry out in the decades to come? That are my questions, that are my comments. I have been maybe too brief, uh, but uh, that's all. So we have a lot of minutes for uh, having a great conversation. So that's all. Thank you. Um, let me remind you, I'm going to open it up, give it to, to Alexander and to Jorge to answer. But uh, let me remind you that uh, everybody, all bodies here, about six or seven of us, um, will we'll have a chance to participate. We've, we've got some time yet. And um, to, to tur turn on your mic, that, that, that's always helpful. Uh, uh, I don't think there's any lip readers here, and uh, and to identify yourself uh, because I'm I'm curious as to who you are. You know, I don't have a chance to chat with you in person, so I'll turn it over to uh, uh, to Alexander first and say um, uh, and respond to to some of the some of the queries, some of the kind of subjects that were brought up by Rodrigo. Alexander. So, Rodrigo, you, you are very right that actually it was a geopolitical view from Paris and Peru was just one element in, in the geo in geopolitical picture. And the se second aspect uh, of this question was the, the piracy issue. So when I say geopolitical issue, France, as you know, had been diminished by uh, Napoleon's defeat, and the restoration government wanted also to restore French prestige. And French prestige was, uh, of course, uh, uh, following Louis XVI. As you know, Louis XVI was very keen to support the Navy, and so uh, as a Following Louis the Sixteenth, uh, Louis the Eighteenth, who was Louis the Sixteenth's brother, wanted to restore uh, the navy abilities. And as you know, uh, under the continental blockade by the British, uh, the French navy had lost its skills, had uh, lost its uh, navigation skills, and now because the ships were being blockaded. So actually, this situation in Latin America. Uh, was a golden opportunity for the Navy to be able to deploy, to be able to show the flag uh, to the new nations, uh, because, and actually there was a quote, uh, which I try to remember, but uh, which said that it was better uh, just to make a very strong impression now than in the future, that uh, that the new nations had to understand that they had to respect French interests, and, and it was better to do it just now. But there were two other issues which justified this naval, those naval deployments. I would say three others. One which I mentioned, which was that the British were already present. The British had already their naval station, and France just wanted to emulate the British, just wanted to uh, be on a par, not really on a par, because France could not necessarily send as many platforms as the British, but try to be there, present, and actually competing on the geopolitical and commercial scene, but locally cooperating with the British, because given the uh, immensity of uh, South America, uh, France, uh, locally, the local French uh, commanders were cooperating with the British to, to uh, in some cases, take care of some British interests in some area, and the British would protect French interests. So it was very important to be there, because otherwise the British would not do it 
either. So, uh, but there, there was during this period of the war of Latin American independence, and I mentioned the case of the General Quintanilla. Uh, it's thanks to Orge because it's Orge who initially directed me to investigate this specific case. But the piracy problem was absolutely enormous uh, because the, the the pirates, many of them actually uh, coming from the United States, uh, their ships had been built in the United States in many cases. Uh, uh, were taking advantage of this ambiguity of these new nations, uh, their flags unknown, you see. So, for instance, if you take uh, Artigas, uh, Artigas in Uruguay, uh, who was um, captured uh, by uh, the, in Paraguay by France, I can't remember exactly the year, but it, ships under his flag continued to sail everywhere and attack, uh, actually, the commerce, but in reality, committing a lot of uh, uh, piracy acts uh, under the flag of Artigas, you see. And, and usually, what was very interesting is that they were operating quite far from, I would say, the mother nation, uh, so that it would be very difficult to check uh, if they were really under control or not. So the, uh, when I'm talking about Artigas, the, the flag of Artigas was very often in, 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 the, in the West Indies. The West Indies was really the center of, of the, that piracy activity. But that piracy activity also took place in the South Sea. And, and, and the General Quintanilla was a very interesting case because this ship, it can be argued that this ship was, according to the Viceroy of Peru, a warship. But at the same time, it was a privateer. It was not technically a warship. You know, it was not true to say that it was on the, on the fleet register of Spain. So it was technically a privateer. But in reality, it was a pirate. It was a pirate. Uh, this ship attacked deliberately that French uh, ship uh, just because it was an easy prey. So actually, France decided to deploy the Navy just for the skills, of course, the seamanship of the sailors, but also to make a strong impression on the British, on the new nations, and also because there was this issue of, of piracy, which had to be, uh, and this issue of piracy was absolutely enormous in the West Indies. Uh, and also there were other uh, strictly French issues. Uh, one of them, uh, was the fear uh, that Napoleon, so that was a, 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 one of the first motives, the fear that Napoleon could escape from St. Helena, come to South America, find some support there. And so France, one reason for the naval presence in America was related to this, to this uh, uh, concern. Alexander, can we can we kind of wrap up your comments so we can get to Jorge? Excuse me, excuse me to have been long. And, 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 and the last uh, thing I just say would be the case of Haiti. And actually, 1825, which is just uh, at the time of Ayacucho, the, the big deployment in the West Indies was uh, intended to make a very strong impression on Haiti to exhort, to extort from Haiti uh, some uh, financial compensation. I close my remarks. Thank you, um, Jorge. You got the you got the mic. Okay, I, I will try to to answer uh, briefly. Uh, uh, remember, there are people here. Maybe I don't know if they want to make some questions. But uh, okay, um, the first question is okay. How local people supported this effort? Well. The Spanish crew were from all around the Spanish Empire. There was a number of Peruvians there. In fact, the commander in chief of the last, of the second expedition, that one of the, uh, the Alexander the First and San Telmo and the Preva, was a, a Limanian, was born in Lima, and was a brigadier of the Royal Spanish Navy. Uh, and he died over there. 
a number uh, of these men, uh, also from America, uh, were part of the crew of the last two ships sent to the Pacific. And that was the reason why they visited and changed hands. So they were should understand that this was a huge uh, civil war, in fact. Uh, okay, your second question, how, how they uh, get involved with local shipping into the war effort? Uh, there was two ways, in fact. Uh, one of them was, okay, I uh, hired the ship and commissioned the ship temporarily for some specific mission. Uh, and, and the other one was, okay, uh, the, the most important thing uh, in, in any maritime environment is trade. So those who were more affected by this war were merchants. And they got a, a, a kind of chamber, chamber of trade. Okay, I will be very powerful. And chamber of trade fitted out uh, armistice because they want to protect their own interest. Okay, the state cannot provide the protection, I will provide my own protection. And the third question is, okay, this well, uh, okay, how the Spanish Royal Navy uh, situation affected the independence? It is, it is a long story, but it can be summarized that you cannot protect distant dominions without a proper navy. Uh, Spanish Navy was in, in very bad condition. Uh, every year there was, I had it here, they published a Navy list. And the Navy list there was more than 64 ships of the line. But in fact, only two can say. Mm -hmm. the, 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 that was, the economy was broken. The state was broken. Uh, and you know, Navy cost a lot of money. Okay. That's it. Okay. I don't know if thank, thank, thank you. Uh, I've got two hands up here. Uh, one from Thomas Snyder, another one from Carlos uh, Trombin. And I'm going to open up this queue. And and uh, and uh, Thomas uh, and, 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 and Carlos and anybody else that wants to speak up, just give us a very, very brief synopsis of your, your interest in what, what you do. You know, a few sentences and then... So we can put you in that context and and sure. uh, and and then we can move along here. So uh, sure, I'll be happy to lead off. Tom Snyder, I'm a retired surgeon, a retired U.S. Naval Reservist. I'm the founder and executive director of the Society for the History of Navy and Medicine. We're actually mounting a wonderful panel in the session that follows this one, and I invite you all to to learn a little bit about the history of maritime medicine. My question necessarily is U.S. U.S.-centric. Um, the U.S. had sent the Macedonian first and the constellation later to South, um, uh, South American waters, and then it formally established the Pacific Squadron in something like 1820. I'm interested to know your take on what role, if any, our naval uh, elements played in the machinations of the Peruvian, co the Peruvian and Chilean coast. Um, Alexander, Jorge, you want to answer? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, well, Alexander mentioned that there was possible uh, uh, British squadron stationed in the Pacific, then the French and the uh, U.S. squadron was stationed down there. Uh, actually, the first U.S. warship going down was Essex, captured that uh, Valparaiso. Um, and then followed the Macedonian constellation and so on. Uh, third task was the usual task of today, to protect national interests. That national interest was by merchants. Uh, since the independence began, there was a, a kind of a, okay, let's go invest there, let's do, uh, do something there. And there was a bunch of guys going down. Uh, same thing that happened in China 30 years ago. So the Navy was there for that purpose. Uh, uh, my, my 
PhD dissertation was on the British Esquire. Uh, and I have to say that, well, I do it well from 1808 until 1839. And sometimes, of course, they have to deal with the, the US Esquire down there. Or, one thing I realized, okay, that the British were far more polite about the US captains. Captains, uh, the US captains were more strongly uh, and sometimes uh, going beyond what was could be considered the regular ways of building things, both with the loyalists and the independents. Uh, they have a number of issues that happened uh, when uh, Esmeralda was captured that in November 1820. Uh, Esmeralda was the front line of the defense of Callao. And there was pretty close to two wars, two warships. One, a British frigate, and the other one, the Macedonian. And most of the Chilean uh, most of the officers and many of the, of the men were angry speaking people. Uh, and of course, well, when uh, some of the crew members of the Esperanza would come to the sea and reach the, the beach, say, okay, no, they have been helped by the British and the North American guy, that those ships were very close to them. So in the morning, the uh, population was in Kayao. Okay. Oh, you can realize they're angry on that because they have sisters or, or brothers or husbands or wherever on that ship. And the next morning, when the Macedonian boat came to buy fruit or vegetables or wherever, they were assaulted. And that one, that, that, that one thing was killed. So, that's an example. It's not uh, the Baltimore issue, as I mentioned in the other presentation. But uh, there was a, a, a lot of a different kind of intervention. That basically, basically, as today, ladies have is a way to protect national interests abroad, and they did that. That's what I can say. Okay, let me let me uh, get Carlos on board, and then we'll turn to Alexander and see if he'd like a comment on on uh, on Thomas's uh, inquiry. Uh, Carlos, you you uh, you're up. Yes, uh, I'm Carlos Tromben, a Chilean naval historian. I work in the Chilean Navy Centro de Estudios Estratégicos, Centro of uh, Strategic Studies in Valparaíso. And uh, I wish to con congratulate both presenters of today. Very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I do have a question for Jorge Ortiz, and it's the following. The extensive use of the Spanish warships require logistic support. Should they are support? Did they get it from Callao or somewhere else? Guayaquil, perhaps, Acapulco? I ask the question because logistical support for Chilean ships in the, at, at that period was very deficient. Uh, because of local facilities in Chile, and one example is the loss of uh, Navio San Martin or the lack of uh, anchors and uh, a deficient uh, state of its hull. This is, that is my question. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, let me, uh, Alexander, or have you? Did you want to? And then I'll turn it over to Jorge just so you get a chance to respond to to the earlier question. Oh, you have to unmute. Yeah. Uh, on on the Macedonian, uh, yes. In November eighteen twenty, as Jorge said, yes, there was an incident and. Uh, a Spanish fort fired on the Macedonian, and the, fire, the Macedonian returned uh, the fire. And uh, I think that two uh, American sailors, just like for the Baltimore incident, uh, were killed. Yes. So, uh, but uh, outside of that, I don't have uh, more more to say. Okay, Jorge. Uh, okay. Uh, well, um, 
KL has a very long story of uh, being a marit an important maritime center. Uh, since 1880, the Peru Bison is his own name. He had been uh, doing uh, maritime duties from California all the way down to the fighting of the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, in 1746, there was a big quake, uh, uh, tsunami, Kayao was destroyed. What, whatever left of that vice royalty navy disappeared. So the royal Spanish navy took over the maritime duties on the Pacific. Uh, and well, pretty much as Kayao, they have uh, uh, what they call the arsenal. Uh, they provide support for the shipping, but the main shipyard was Guayaquil. Guayaquil was the main ship all the way during the period uh, colonial times, and, uh, and of course, that belongs to the Peru Battle Royal uh, until the independence in the 1820s. Bad uh, Callao has also the facilities, they, they got off. Oh. Of course, they got ships, but they got a naval hospital, they got an arsenal, they got a, a, a pilot academy in 1791. So, there was, there was a, a, a naval standard over there. Not big, but enough to provide uh, support for, for the uh, Royal Naval Forces, and not not only naval forces, but also merchants. I, I hope that answers yes. your question. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I, do, do we have until 3.15 or is it over at 3 o'clock here? I'm, I'm on central time and I forgot. For, I remember reading at 13.30 to 15 something. Oh, until 3.14. Yeah, okay. Tenemos unos 15 minutos más. Okay. Um, I, I, uh, every, every part of this discussion has brought something to mind. Uh, I wrote a dissertation on the shipyards of colonial Guayaquil, and I, 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 the only time I've ever seen Guayaquil before was picking up bananas on a Graceline ship with my family coming up from South America. And it was, I enjoyed it. And, uh, the Navy today is very active as it has been, you know, and, uh, and all of and the issues that we're addressing here, the influence that a few ships and a few men, or a few more than a few, are, are fascinating. I, and uh, so I, I, this panel has, has really been interesting to me from, from the perspective of having done some, some work and having been in the Navy. You know, we, my, my one war experience uh, was off the coast of uh, Santo Domingo. And you go, what, what war experience could he have had off the coast of Santo Domingo? Well, I was on an LSD. I was on an LSD. I wasn't on LSD uh, back in the mid '60s, and we had a UDT team. One of the predecessors of these, as you Navy guys know, of the SEALs, and we we're bringing them up from 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 St. Thomas, and we were going to set them ashore in Santo Domingo, April 1965. Okay, all you historians, what was going to go? On? The 82nd Airborne beat us to it. They got into Santo Domingo to keep, keep another Fidel Castro from coming. And, uh, and so we sailed on past, well, we steamed on past. And then six months later, okay, this is the way the Navy works sometimes, I think. All of us young officers and older officers got a notification that we all got a Dom Rep medal. A Dom Rep medal. So we're sitting in the, in the wardroom. Says, and what's that for? Dom Rep. And a younger one goes, Dom what? I said, Dominican Republic, stupid. That's that's you know, we we were there, and then everybody goes, did anybody see it? I said, yeah, I was standing watching Combat Information Center. I saw it on the radar, and that's when I began to wonder about all the guys coming back from Vietnam. What are all those medals for? And you know, some of them were legitimate. Well, one was for landing in Saigon, another one was taking off from Saigon, another one was being there, you know, and and got a little bit of glimpse. Some of you guys were have been in the you know in the, in the navy active duty in the reserves and know that there's a lot to be learned and it stays with you a long time those some of the things i learned as a young officer i still talk about okay well are there any more comments or 
our, our questions. Um, uh, David's back. And the, Lovely here. Oh, yeah, they got a question. Yeah, okay. It, well, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up then. Uh, if there are no more, uh, I oh, wish I could. Uh, Larry, there is a question here. Okay, <laughs> who's got a question? Uh, you, you, don't, you, you cannot see him, but believe there is a question here. <laughs> who who can I see? Oh, uh, uh, I, I don't know how the camera works here, but. <laughs> All right. Side. All right. Uh, well, is, is somebody that I can see have a question? Raise yeah. your hand by pressing the little button down there, and your little hand will come up. He says, there's... No, no, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So my question is, if the Spanish Navy was so in such a, a terrible effect, why didn't they at least focus on one part of the Americas, whether that was Mexico, whether that was kind of the northern part of South America or northern America? Why didn't they focus at least their efforts on keeping one piece instead of losing it all so quickly or was that not even possible to consider because of national prestige i, I, I don't think national prestige has nothing no no nothing but not the big deal uh, <laughs> actually they tried to make an effort they reconquered what is now they venezuela colombia uh, uh they managed to send an expedition and reconquer that they managed to control Mexico. So the Caribbean area was still somehow to the same. But they tried to set this, that uh, revolt in January 1820 to force the king to accept the constitution. Wasn't the Spanish were supposed to be sent to reconquer Rio de la Plata? Uh, uh, the other airports were far more complicated sending troops to the West Coast. So it, it, it was, a, a, from my point of view, you know, I, I feel that Spain lose the great opportunity well before that, which is trying to make a more transitional process yeah. to create kingdom. Uh, who are tied pretty much of the British model. And well, that's what politicians are for. Okay, Larry. Anybody else? I, uh, I, uh, I'm glad the Americans were represented by pirates and privateers uh, in a few instances out there in the Rio de la Plata. Uh, and I, it, it, and that, that Ed Jorge mentioned the Essex in 1812 in the Pacific, and it's a fascinating story. We don't have time to go into here because it, it tells a lot about the, uh, the character of many people, early, early Americans, not simply South Americans, but North Americans. Okay, if, unless there are some other questions here, and I, I don't want to stop anybody, I'm going to uh, wrap it up. Uh, I'm going to thank our paper presenters, Alexander and Jorge, and, uh, and uh, thank... Uh, uh, our commentator, you know, uh, Rodrigo, for for bringing to focus uh, us on some of the the bigger issues and the bigger questions, um, and and they 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 are fascinating. And they're in today's world, at least in this country, we're massacring history, uh, and we're using it for purposes that are just incredible. And I'm not going to mention any uh, the left or the right or anything like that. And it's important for those of us who are historians or love history to make sure the right story is told, that, it, that, that, that it's consistent, not simply with the facts, but what people were thinking at the time. Okay, I, I, I'm sounding like an old chair of a history department, which I am, and, and, uh, and I'm talking to friends here who share an interest. And uh, at least at my age, it's almost siesta hour, uh, you know, and that's claiming part of my Latin American heritage. So I wanna thank you all for for being here. Thank Jorge for organizing it and for uh, Ernesto and Alexander being here. Thank you, the, 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 the members of the of the audience. I see your images. And this has been a, a neat neat session because I think somebody's in Paris, somebody is in Los Angeles, somebody's in Peru, somebody's in in, in Chile. And we we couldn't have done this. 
back in the old days, you know, and, and today who wants to get in an airplane? Okay. I, I am going to uh, close it here and, uh, and tell uh, Kevin Clymer, Ensign Clymer, who is, uh, you know, he's the geek, the geek hero here who helped organize this. Kev Kevin's a recent graduate of the United States Naval Academy. Yeah. And uh, I think his next assignment is uh, nuclear power school, but he'll find that easy compared to organizing all of us in the, in the, in the world. So I'm going to close the session. Thank you all. You all have a wonderful visit if you're up at, at, at wherever you are and have a wonderful weekend coming up. And uh, and uh, if you need to get in touch with us, you know, you know how to find us on the uh, on the net. Thank you very much. Bravo. Thanks, Larry. Yeah. yeah. Gracias. Gracias a todos. You know. Gracias. Que vaya muy bien. Gracias. Ciao. Ciao. Right. Oh.